Welcome everyone to CS 264A, Automated Reasoning, and this is our uh, lecture six. What we'll do today is um, uh, finish what we need to say about chapter four, and uh, that would be a discussion uh, of the subject of uh, maximum satisfiability or max sat. Uh, this is an optimization version of satisfiability that has uh, quite a bit of practical applications. So we will do that and then uh, we will transition into the second part of the foundations in this course. Um, and that part of foundation uh, relates to uh, the subject of tractable circuits and um, uh, the connected subject of uh, knowledge compilation. Uh, but before we do that uh, transition or we will do that transition, first by talking about some applications. Uh, we, we talked about the course having two components, foundations and then applications, but we will uh, uh, do some of the applications today um, also to give people the, some concrete feel of how some of the techniques uh, we've discussed will be used. In particular, we'll discuss applications to probabilistic reasoning. We will do a light version of that today just to again motivate and give you a sense and we will revisit the subject in more detail uh, later. So again, we'll do max set first and then we would uh, transition uh, by talking a little bit about applications and motivating uh, the second part of the foundation. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera off at this point and then um, head to the whiteboard so that we can start uh, with our discussion. As discussed, we will be uh, starting by talking about what's known as uh, max sat. And uh, this is an optimization version of sat. And the idea is as follows. So typically we have a knowledge base that is uh, made of clauses. Uh, we've been looking mostly at CNF as our input. And in satisfiability, we try to find a variable assignment uh, that satisfy the clauses. And if there is no such assignment, we say that the knowledge base is unsatisfiable. So we basically have two outputs here, sat uh, plus truth assignment or variable assignment or unsat. Now in max sat, what we try to do is find a truth assignment that maximizes the number of satisfied clauses. So this would be particularly useful if we have uh, the situation here where the knowledge base is unsatisfiable. So in, in satisfiability, we just come back with a no, it's not satisfiable. And in MaxSat, we try to do our best in terms of maximizing the largest number of um, clauses. And you can see why it is an optimization problem from that point of view. And there are variations. So um, in the sense that we may actually even assign weights uh, to these clauses. And in that case, we will get what we would call a weighted uh, CNF, where we will have each clause assigned a particular weight. And Here's the second clause with its own weight and so on. And in that case, we are giving like different levels of importance to clauses. And then let's say if we go ahead and satisfy, um, for example, alpha one, alpha seven, and alpha 10, then the weights in that case will be W1 plus W7 plus W, uh, 10. And uh, we would refer to this as the score in that case. So suppose that those are the only three that got satisfied and the others got violated under a certain variable assignment, then this would be the score of that particular variable assignment. And then our goal would be to fi find a variable assignment that maximizes uh, this score. So in, in that particular case, we would say that we want to maximize score. Now, you can think of the original vanilla flavor uh, max sat as having a weight of one for every uh, clause, but more generally, we can have arbitrary uh, weights. Another way of looking at this is instead of 
looking at the clauses that were satisfied and adding up their costs, therefore leading to a score and maximizing that score, we can look at it uh, by um, adding weights of violated clauses, right? So you give me a variable assignment, and then I would look at those clauses that were violated, and then I add up their weights, and we call that the cost. And then our goal would be to minimize the cost, All right? So you can either talk about uh, the score of a variable assignment, or you can talk about the cost of a variable assignment. And if we are looking at the score of a variable assignment, then we try to find one that maximizes the score. But if we look at the cost of a variable assignment, then we try to minimize. And in that case, sometimes people talk about min sat instead of max sat. They're basically the same thing. It's just a matter of how you formulate things. So in, in your chapter and uh, the examples, we actually work mostly with costs. So we define the cost of a variable assignment, and then we try to uh, minimize it. And again, you do have either the vanilla flavored um, max sat or min sat, where every clause has a weight of one, or you can have the weighted versions where we allow um, arbitrary weights. So we'll take a concrete example in uh, just a little bit to uh, see how uh, max sat works. And that will give you a sense of how useful it can be uh, but let me uh, first mention that there are different methods for solving uh, MaxSat. And someone is asking about uh, where is this discussed? That's in your chapter four. Uh, so you can solve MaxSat in a number of ways. Actually, let me ask you that question. Um, we did something last time that should be use or usable to solve this? Can someone type in um, some method we discussed for actually SAT that can be kind of used for this? Local search, excellent. Someone mentioned local search. And those would be basically applicable in this case. And then the other thing you can do is you can use systematic search. Systematic search are uh, algorithms that are similar to DPLL, right, based on some kind of depth first search. But in this particular case, you would use something known as branch and bound, some variation on depth first search. And the uh, last way you can do this is by using resolution or a variation on it known as max sat resolution. So in our discussion here, we will just do this last one which is this guy. Uh, this you're familiar with. Uh, this is kind of a classical uh, max set resolution, which actually relatively recent, about 10, 15 years ago. So in this world of logic, 10, 15 years ago is relatively recent. And we'll see that there is uh, an extension of directed resolution that can be used to solve max set. It's pretty remarkable, actually. Um, of a method, and you'll see uh, when we when we do that. All right, so let's go ahead and do a concrete example first of max sat before we talk about how we can solve this um, in a systematic way using uh, max sat uh, resolution. So what we have here, and this example is from your chapter, uh, the idea is we have uh, some kind of a satellite that needs to uh, take images. And there are four images that it can take. Let's call them I1, I2, I3, and I4. And these images uh, have degrees of importance. So what we're going to do is uh, assign numbers that uh, reflect the importance of these images. And we're going to give the first one a weight of five, and the second one a weight of four, and this is three, and this is six. So these are weights um, representing importance of images. And then we have some, uh, if you want to call it constraints, right? So because this, this is a satellite, and it happens that I1 and I4 cannot be taken to, together. Um, let's say they're too far apart, so we, we can just do them together. And the same thing for I2 and I4, 
we cannot uh, take them together. And let's say that uh, I1 and I3 overlap, sorry, I1 and I2 overlap. So if I do both of them, uh, this is not as valuable. So I wanna discount the value in that case by uh, two. And then similarly, I1 and I3 also overlap. So if I end up taking both, then I want to discount by one. And finally, I2 and I3 also overlap. So if I take them both simultaneously, then I want to dis discount by one. And now the goal is to actually select uh, a subset of these images to uh, take while maximizing the benefit, right? So well, see now is that this can actually be formulated as a max set problem. And in particular, we'll end up having a weighted CNF. And let's see how uh, basically this works. So we're gonna have the weighted clauses kind of fit into uh, three categories. So this is the first category. And you can see that what I have here is unit clauses, right? And then the weight of each one attached next to it. Let me write the other two guys and then we will uh, explain them. So we actually have uh, three different categories, uh, as I mentioned. So this is the first category of clauses, and this is the second one, and this is the third. And in thinking about this, uh, we need to actually uh, think about costs, all right? And uh, what happens if I violate uh, something? So in the first uh, four guys, if I do not take image one, then I will incur a cost of five. So if I violate this guy, that is I don't satisfy it and therefore I didn't take that image, then I take a cost of five. And similarly for these guys, if I do not take image four, then I incur a cost of six. Now let's look of what's happening with these guys. So what does it mean to violate this guy? If I violate this guy, I'm gonna incur a cost of uh, two. Now violating this uh, means that I take image one and image two together, right? Uh, and if you uh, see here, uh, image one and two overlap, so I'm discounting by two. So basically I incur that kind of a cost. So these, uh, uh, if we wanna actually mark these also as three categories, this is one category and this is another and this is a third. So what's happening here is that these three clauses are capturing this, right? And here, if I violate this, then I'm taking I1 and I3 together and therefore I'm incurring a cost of one. If I violate this, I'm taking two and three together and therefore I'm incurring a cost of uh, one. Now, if you look at the last two guys, what happens here? If I violate this, then I incur a cost of infinity. Violating this meaning taking one and four together. And what we said here is one and four cannot be taken together. Um, similarly for this, if I violate this, it means that I took I2 and I4 together. And we already said here that these cannot be taken together. So this is a cost of infinity. You can think of this last category is what we would call hard constraints. And these are soft constraints. So I, I do not want to violate the hard uh, constraints. Uh, we will uh, keep going with this example, but let me just take a quick look at the board here to see what uh, people may be asking. Okay, so I think uh, someone you know is mixing reward with cost. So I know it can be a little bit confusing. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to elaborate a little bit more, but let's just focus currently on penalties. So we will think of these as penalties that we incur if we violate uh, that uh, clause. In fact, okay, let me before moving on with the, with the example, maybe let me do something here on the side just to explain this a little bit. If we just look at uh, I1 and I2, just only on these two uh, variables and only consider the cost that we have here. Uh, let me show you a little table here. Uh, so if we have I1 and I2, and then we would have four combinations in this case, right? They're both taken, this is taken, this is not, um, and so on. These are the four combinations. And let me look here at the score versus the cost, 
All right. So what I want to put here is every time I satisfy something. So let's assume we only have these two clauses at, at the at the top here, right? So we're just looking at these two guys. So every time I satisfy something, then the cause the, the score increases. So in this case, if I want to look at the score, what should I put here for uh, taking both I1 and I2? Can someone type a number here? What should I put as far as a score? I satisfied this clause and I satisfied that clause, right? So nobody's typing anything. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, well, now, now I'm getting a whole bunch of numbers. Uh, they're all over the place, but a couple of them are correct. So let's just do uh, the, the one by one. So if I satisfied I1, this is I1, then I'm getting a five. And if I satisfied I2, uh, then I'm getting a four. So this should be a nine. And some of you did that. Let's take a look at the second one. What happened here? I satisfied I1, so that's a five. And that's it. I didn't satisfy this, so I'm not uh, getting a reward for that. Now let's look at the last third guy here. That would be a four. And in this case, I didn't satisfy either. So that's basically a zero, right? So this should be a nine here and five, four, and zero. Okay. Now let's look at the cost. All right, so now we do it the other way around. So every time I violate something, I incur a penalty. So let's look at here. Uh, did I violate anything here with this, with this assignment? Uh, yes or no? Did I violate anything here? Remember, we're only looking at these two clauses. Uh, no, I didn't violate anything. So there is no cost here. So let's look at the second guy. Uh, which one was violated? We look at what was violated and I incur the cost. In this case, what was violated is I2, so I incur a cost of four. And let's look here, which uh, was violated. That's I1 was violated, so I incur a cost of five. And finally, in the last one, I violated both of them, right? So I incur the cost of five plus four. So five plus four equals nine, all right? So what you can do here is you say either I want to maximize the score, in which case you'll end up picking this guy, uh, or you say I want to minimize the cost, and then you end up actually picking up the same guy, right? And you can see when you add the score plus the cost, you should get a constant, all right? So, um, so again, uh, we, we, in this example, we, we just looked at uh, a subset of the problem. We just looked at the first. We assume that we only have a max set that has two weighted clauses. These, these guys were not doing any discounting or, or anything. Okay, so this is just to uh, try to uh, clarify this uh, difference between cost and uh, score. I know it gets confusing, but that's the way it is. And that's why sometimes people talk about uh, max set or min set, but I think this should be enough for us now. Let me um, keep going with the example as, as we did it. And now we'll, we're looking back at the full example and we're gonna go ahead and see uh, costs a little bit in, in more detail uh, by looking at, again, the whole problem. So remember, in this case, what we have is uh, I1, and I2, and I3, and I4. And that's a big table. We're, we're not gonna look at all of it. Uh, we're gonna look at some examples uh, of the variable instantiations and their cost, all right? And you're gonna help me with that. So let me put three instantiations in particular. So let's say one, 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 one. Let's look at another instantiation, which is one, 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 zero. And uh, finally, let me do zero, uh, zero, one, one. So let's uh, try to look at these particular variable instantiations and, and see how worthy are they or uh, by looking at the cost. And remember, uh, when we're doing cost, uh, you look at the variable instantiation, you walk through the clauses and anything that is violated, you add the cost of that. So the very first one where I took all four images, can someone tell me what is the cost in that particular case, right? So you, you want to walk through these guys and if something is violated, you uh, add 
the cost of that as, as an infinity. Okay, someone is saying that this is already infinity and that's correct. Okay, you didn't have to go through all of them. Uh, we did take one and four together that violates this guy and that's infinity. Okay, you can check the others, but it doesn't matter at this point. I already violated a hard constraint. So I'm getting a cost of infinity. Now let's look at the second one. Okay, so this was our first one we looked at, and now let's look at this guy and try to see what is the cost of that variable instantiation. And again, what we need to do is walk through these clauses one by one and uh, if one is violated, we go ahead and add its cost. So let's go, do, let's do that. Let's walk through the, through these guys. Okay. The first one, this was not violated because I have I1 equals one. That's satisfied. Okay. We, we go to the second one. Uh, that's also not violated. Remember, we're looking at this row here. Okay. Okay. So this is not violated. We go through that guy. It's not violated. Now I4 is violated because I have I4 zero. So then I already have a six here. And let's see what else uh, we need. Let's go to this guy here. Uh, did I violate this guy? Uh, I took I1 and I2 together. So I did violate this guy, right? So that's a two here. And let's go to the next one. I1 and I3, did I take them together? I1 and I3, I did. So I violated this as well. So that's here. Let's see what else. Um, now we're looking at this guy, two and three. Did I take two and three together? Um, I did. And so basically in this case, I will also incur another cost. Now let's look at the last two guys. Did I take one and four together? No. Did I take two and four together? No. So that's basically it. And then I should get a cost of 10 in this case. All right, so for this particular example, if I want to mark the guys that I violated, it was this guy, and then this guy, this guy, and this guy, they were all violated. These are the only ones that got uh, violated, and therefore I'm incurring the cost of 6 plus 2 plus 1 plus uh, 1. Okay, guys, so this is basically what's going on here. And remember what the goal of MaxSat is, is basically to uh, find a variable instantiation that minimizes this particular cost in this case. Okay, let's do one last one here before we go and see how we can solve these things. So let me look at this guy here. And can you guys try to do that and tell me what's gonna happen in this case as far as the uh, total cost Right, so what you need to do is check the things that got violated and basically add their costs. Okay, so I'm already getting a couple of answers saying that, okay, now there's more answers, uh, nine. So I have uh, at least four answers and all of them are saying it should be five plus four equals nine. Excellent, actually, they were now I'm getting way more answers. Um, and that would be the penalty. And it looks like this got violated, uh, the first one. The second one got violated. And apparently that's pretty much it. Nothing else got violated. All right. And in fact, if you go ahead and do this whole table with 16 entries, you're going to find that this guy is the optimal. Uh, you will not find any other uh, variable instantiation that does better than this one. So this is actually the optimal one. So if you are doing max sat in this case, then you will be getting back, you should be getting back uh, I1 equals zero, I2 equals zero, I3 equals one, and I4 equals one, uh, which is effectively says that you should take images three and four, uh, but not one and two. All right, folks, so this is the MaxSat problem. And uh, as I said, it's practically uh, important when we do the transition in the second part and talk about probabilistic reasoning, we'll actually see that uh, one of the problems in probabilistic reasoning gets reduced to this. If you know how to solve MaxSat, then you can uh, solve that particular problem in probabilistic reasoning. Okay, so what we'll do 
next and the rest of the time on uh, the subject is to show you how to uh, solve MaxSat using um, a version of resolution. As I said, you can do local search, you can do systematic search like branch and mount, but we will be focusing on resolution. And this technique that we'll be mentioning next uh, it's actually, as I said, relatively recent in the last 10 to 15 years. It's pretty uh, interesting. So let's go ahead and um, do that. We'll start by making an observation about traditional resolution and how that we can not just use that, but we need to do some kind of a modification on it. So if I had two clauses, let's say X or L1, and another clause which is not X or L1, uh, L2. And in this case, uh, L1 and, and L2 are literals. So, so these are binary clauses, right? So if I were doing unit, uh, if I was doing classical resolution, then from these guys, I will conclude L1 or L2. Right, and then instead of two clauses, um, I end up having uh, three clauses, right? And um, that's how it works. And now we'll see that if you are doing max sad, this will be problematic. And the reason it will be problematic is that even though L1 or L2 is a um, logical conclusion from the first two, and therefore from a logical point of view, I can add it to the knowledge base, we will see that if you do that, you will change the cost function. Uh, as a result, and therefore you end up having a new max sat uh, problem. So uh, we will see uh, this now using a concrete example, right? So let's say I have my delta um, is uh, x or y, and then the other uh, clause that I have is not x or um, not z, all right? Let's say this is what I have. And let's look at the cost function in this particular case. So if you look at uh, x, y, z, and I'm just going to look at one particular instantiation, which is sufficient to illustrate the point. So let me look at 1, 0, 1. Let me look at that particular variable instantiation. And this is my original knowledge base. It has two clauses. Can someone tell me what the cost of this guy is? What is the cost of this particular variable instantiation in this case? 1, 0, 1. What should I put here? It's very simple. Uh, in this case, uh, this is unweighted set. So we're going to assume that every clause has a weight of one, right? Um, so you can think of this as just da comma one, da comma one, all right? But let me take these. So what should I put in this case? And people are saying one. Okay, this is a cost of one because I'm violating only one particular clause in this case. And it is this clause that is being violated and therefore a cost of one. Okay, now if we go ahead and do resolution uh, on this guy, what do I get? Uh, I resolve over X, then I get Y or not Z. Okay, so now I have three clauses. So this is cost one and uh, and if we um, refer to this guy as basically delta one, I'm gonna refer to the whole thing as delta two. Now we know that delta one is equivalent to delta two, right? But now what happens to cost two in this case? What is the cost of that variable instantiation in this case? Remember, now I have three clauses. So I have to look at uh, which one are violated and I have to add a one for every clause that's violated. What is the cost in that particular case? And, and someone is saying it's two uh, because this is also violated at this particular point, right? Uh, this says I need Y to be true or Z to be false. And in this case, basically. So what happened here, if you just go ahead and do resolution, and add clauses, uh, then you change the cost function and you end up changing the max set problem. So what's gonna happen in max set resolution, which I will explain next, is it will end up addressing this problem by basically um, doing a little bit more than simply adding that guy. So we will do resolution, we will add that guy, but we will get rid of the original two and, and add some more clauses known as compensation clauses so that the cost is preserved. 
uh, I have to illustrate this one, and then I will this notion of the max resolution step, the rule, and then we will talk about how do we use it to actually solve the problem completely, and and you'll you'll find it quite amazing. Um, so let me now show you how max resolution works. Um, and I just wanted to motivate that first as we did here. So um, let's get rid of this. So we'll illustrate it first on binary clauses uh, because it's simpler. And then I'll show you the more general version, which uh, looks a little bit uh, hairy. But let's say that we have the two clauses, uh, binary clauses in this case, which is x or L1. And the other one is not x or L2. And again, L1 and L2 are literals. So these are basically binary clauses. So here's what happens. What happens is you do the resolution and therefore you get L1 or L2, okay? But you don't keep these guys. These guys go away and they get basically replaced by what we call compensating clauses. So let me show you what they look like and then we'll see what's going on, okay. So this is what we call, the first one is what we call the resolvent in the past. And these guys uh, are called compensation clauses that we added. So this is basically max set resolution. And in a sense, the, the guarantee here is that you started with this, you had a cost function, and then you ended up with these and the guarantee is you're gonna have the same cost function. We're not gonna prove this, but you will have the same cost function and you can go back to the previous example and uh, check and, and you will see that the cost function will be preserved. So the other thing is when we look at it this way, it's really, this is not really an inference rule, but you can think of it as a transformation. It transforms uh, the knowledge base, right? Um, because it does, throw away some of the uh, clauses in the original knowledge base. So what happened here is, if you wanna visualize it, I want you to at least remember the binary one. Uh, we had the resolvent as usual. And what happened here is that clause was there. And then I added the negation of this literal, not L2. And then the second clause was there, but I augmented it by adding the negation of the first literal, not L1. So that's that's the pattern here. Uh, this is a special case of the more general pattern when we have uh, non-binary clauses, which we'll take a look at uh, in just a second, but I just wanted you to see what's going on here. Okay, that is the max resolution step for binary. Let's look at the non-binary case, and then we will see uh, how you can actually use this in a systematic fashion to solve max set, and then we'll take a full example. Okay, uh, someone is asking, why did we negate and this? Okay, we're not proving these, so you're just gonna take them as is. Um, it's it's a rule. I'm, I'm giving you a transformation that if you had these two clauses and you resolve them using max resolution, this is the outcome. Um, and the guarantee here is that the cost function is preserved. The other thing is, why is this useful? You'll see in just a little bit. But I want to uh, show you the more general uh, case first. Um, it would look hairy. Uh, that's fine. Uh, I don't know if we're going to ask you to remember it. Uh, you probably want to remember the binary case, but for the more general case, let's just go ahead and do it. And um, we'll take um, a full, we'll, we'll go then to how to use this to actually solve Maxa. Now, in this case, what we have is um, we have X or a whole bunch of literals, let's call them L1 or da 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 or LM. And then uh, we have, um, let me use small x. And then we have not x or O1, da da da, and here ON. And let me refer to this whole thing as C1. And let me refer to this whole thing as C2. So if you want to think about it, what I have is X or C1 and X, uh, not X or C2, okay? Let me write what happens in this case if you resolve these two particular guys. And then don't worry if it looks too um, complicated. 
actually the pattern is pretty uh, simple eventually. So we resolve uh, and therefore, as you would expect, we will end up getting C1 or C2, right? Like we did before. So I resolved this with that and I got this. This was the resolvent. Now we have to do the compensation clauses. And now you're not just gonna get one compensating clause for each, you're gonna get a whole bunch of them. Okay, bear with me as I write this. All right, so what happened here is uh, just like before, we had the resolvent and each one of the original clauses, remember, we're actually resolving this with that. Each one of the uh, clauses generate a bunch of uh, compensation clauses. And basically the pattern is simple. This is the first clause, it's always there, uh, that guy. And then I'm augmenting it in different ways. Uh, I'm augmenting it based on the literals of the other clause. So not O1 and then O1 or not O2, da, 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 all the way O1, da, da, da. Okay, you can see the pattern here. And similarly for the second guy, the second clause is being refined into a whole bunch of clauses by augmenting it uh, with these guys. Now, what we did above here is just a special case of that. Okay, uh, the, again, the point is, if you were to do a max sat resolution on these two guys, then you would replace them. You will take these guys out and put all of these guys in and you're guaranteed that the cost function would be preserved. You're not going to remember this. Um, you want to remember this one for the binary case. And um, let's see how much time we have. We're basically running out of time here. Uh, what we'll do when we get back from our break, we will show you how this works uh, or how can you use this rule to systematically solve uh, MaxSat. And uh, we'll take a concrete example. It's pretty actually uh, intriguing as, as you will see. And that will basically be the end of our discussion here. Now in your chapter, there is a version of this for weighted clauses where, where clauses are not just have a weight of one, but have arbitrary weights. We will not go over that, but if you're curious, you can read about this. All right, uh, so we have one more portion on this. We'll do it after we come back. So let's take our 10 minute break and come back at 11. Thank you. <laughs> 